Executive Director of the Fallon Wilderness and Nineveh Foundations. And this is our first annual gathering hosted by the Nineveh Foundation. And what we hope to do in future summers is have a, a time to meet and bring other speakers, such as Brent, to be able to share pertinent issues that matter to the Nineveh and Mount Holly communities. So I'm thrilled with the turnout and also want to um, appreciate that this is being filmed. So hopefully you'll have a chance if you miss anything or want to let others who aren't able to be here know about that. As many of you may know and some of you may not know, um, in May, the Nineveh Foundation and the Farm and Wilderness Foundation boards join forces to, um, to conserve what is now going to be over 4,800 acres of land between the Woodward um, property in Plymouth up to the Nineveh Lake area. And what that has provided for Farm and Wilderness is an amazing opportunity to not only um, increase our conservation mission and stay true to what Nineveh has done for years um, with, within this community, but also to join forces and provide even more resources and access to community members. So I want to appreciate that. And you'll have an opportunity after Brett's presentation and Q&A to ask any questions about that. With that, I want to introduce um, Andy Schultz, who is going to be then um, kicking this off. And he is a longtime Nineveh Foundation board member, now as a part of the Farmer Womanism and Nineveh Foundation board, and also a Mount Holly resident. And I have to say, having worked with him for four years on this project of joining forces, that um, it wouldn't have happened without his leadership, Dave Martin, and many other people who were involved in that and all of you who probably gave feedback and in behind the scenes provided support. So I want to thank you for that. And um, Andy, if you can kick sure. us off. Thanks. So um, thank you, Rebecca. I want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge Rebecca and Jay Coleman and uh, Jen and Tom and uh, Silas, our forester, uh, all of whom have done a wonderful job uh, bringing these organizations together and uh, helping us to advance our conservation mission. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am that after 50 years of uh, the Nineveh Foundation trying to uh, do all its work with volunteers that we now have a relationship with Farm and Wilderness that I think will benefit both organizations uh, in large measure because we've got people like, like Jay and Jen and Tom and Rebecca who um, can bring their knowledge and uh, energy to this enterprise. So we have lots to look forward to, and I hope this, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure this meeting, this presentation will be the first of, of many. And so that's just one more thing that we'll be able to bring to the community, and we're excited about that. So with that said, I want to introduce uh, Brett Engstrom. Brett has been uh, an ecologist and botanist for 30 years or more. He lives in Marshfield, Vermont. He does uh, ecological inventories for organizations like Nineveh Foundation and for government agencies. He's done work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency, for the Vermont Department of Forests, Parks and Recreation, and uh, uh, interesting uh, factoid, uh, Brett himself was a farm and wilderness camper back in the 60s. So it's uh, everything uh, comes around uh, and goes around. Uh, so Brett's done just a fabulous job. I, I'll let him explain his work, but it took him two years tromping around Nineveh's uh, 32, 30, 300 acres, uh, identifying some very unusual features that we have. And uh, I think. The last thing I want to say before Brett comes up is, uh, but for the areas around the uh, camp programs that Farm and Wilderness operates, Nineveh's lands are open to the public for hunting, fishing, uh, hiking around, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing. There are designated uh, uh, snowmobile trails that are, that, uh, like the Vast Trail goes through our lands. The Catamount Cross Country Ski Trail growth fair lands. So, the Nineveh lands present um, a lot of opportunities for both locals and uh, visitors to enjoy the outdoors. And uh, 
look forward to seeing you out there in the woods. Brett? Thanks, Andy. Well, let's just take a little tour of 3,300 plus acres of the Nineveh Foundation lands. Um, and we're going to start with a bird's eye view. And I don't suppose there's any way we can make it darker in here, is there? Okay, we're going to have a little bit challenging uh, lighting operation here. Um, but this is an aerial photo of the uh, Nineveh, really central Vermont. And as you can see, or maybe not see so well, <laughs> Uh, Killington is up in the left, uh, upper left corner. And if you can look over here, this is a Scutney right here. And if you have keen eyes, you can barely make out Lake Nineveh. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, but this is really faded. Um, it's right in here. No, here it is right in the center. And the point I, I, I put this map up first is to sit, get a sense of where we are in the landscape, in the Nineveh Foundation lands. We're really in a pivotal point in the Green, uh, the green Mountains. And it's a transition from the Northern Green Mountains and uh, the, the Coolidge Range down into the Southern Green Mountains. And so you see sort of a, an arc the mountains do here. And it goes like this. And notice there's all the, the fields and forests, and there's Rutland up, up here. And uh, then you got the Connecticut Valley over here. Um, so it's a pretty, this is very important in terms of the landscape of a, a mountainous landscape, largely undeveloped. Ski areas, yes, but uh, it's a, a really important link between the north, uh, northern Green Mountains and the southern Green Mountains. Okay, this is the same image, but it's a close-up of the Nineveh Foundation lands. Of course, the lake is right here, and you have the parcel, the Bear Mountain uh, parcel. South Saltash Mountain is here, and um, you can see it's largely undeveloped area, and as I was saying, this is the connection point between the northern and the southern Green Mountains. That's Route 103 right here at the bottom of the image of the screen. And for those of you that uh, like topographic maps, which I uh, love, uh, whenever I do an inventory like this, this is the first uh, the map I look at is a, the USGS topographic map. And why do I look at it? It's because, especially in the mountains, the topography is the key to understanding the natural communities, uh, where water goes, which is one of the biggest, most important ecological features of any property, is where the water is. And I wanted to point out a couple things. Um, Okay, once again, Bear Mountain, Saltash Mountain, you have this beautiful bowl here. And then you, when you come down, you see there's a pretty flat area at a, high, a fairly high elevation, 1,800 feet or more. And then you, uh, and that extends all throughout here. And this is north of the lake. And then you drop down to another bench and another flat area that's at a lower elevation. And, and the flat areas, as it turned out, are very important. If, if you look south of the lake, there's also an area that's very unusual. That it's, it doesn't look flat, but it actually turns out to be quite flat. And when, I'm, when I was first starting this inventory, I looked at this map and I said, Gosh, that's uh, interesting topography, the, the flat area. It doesn't show many uh, wetlands on the maps. There are a little bit of wetlands that are shown. But I said, I wonder what that flat area is like. Well, it turns out that's a very important um, 
feature of the landscape are the flat areas. Okay, I'm gonna start with the lake. That's the heart of it, and it's an ecological gem. Uh, lake Nineveh is, has uh, numerous uh, rare and uncommon plant species. Of course, it's uh, home to loons and uh, a myriad of other wildlife. Um, I was not charged with inventorying the lake waters themselves, although I was given a day to do an inventory of the invasive species on the shoreline around the lake. So I had the pleasure of paddling um, around the lake once. And you'll see th this is um, the aquatic community, uh, both the, the plants and all the wildlife in the shallows is very prominent in certain areas. This is on the south end of the lake and you'll notice the, what's called water shield, the, the floating uh, plant there. And then you see these little sticks coming up, these little, mm, looks like stems of grass or something. That turns out to be uh, uh, a rare uh, water bulrush, and it's actually flowering there. And these are sticking up out, barely out of the water. And they're fascinating because they, underwater, the, all the leaves are these fine filaments. And most years, you don't even see these flowering stems. But that's all there is these underwater, is these stems, uh, these uh, leaves that are like just very fine filaments. And then every once in a while, like this year, this or last fall, when I did the, got to this area, you get the flowering event. And so around the, the uh, lakeshore, the shallows, you have uh, the aquatic, various aquatic bed communities. And then you see the shoreline here has cattail marsh. And it varies around the lake what the actual shoreline is like. And it's hard to see here, but there's, as, uh, as many of you know, uh, many of the places around the shoreline are very shrubby. And in a way, I thought of that as a, a sort of a, a very particular habitat. And a lot, a lot of winterberry, if you're familiar with that shrub, um, uh, leather leaf, uh, sweet gale, things like that. Um, but the shoreline, they're mostly big, tall shrubs. Uh, and it's a wetland community of, of sorts. Now, the real gem in terms of wetlands around the lake is, of course, in the south bay of the lake. And this is a large peatland. You can think of it as a bog, but it's a little different than a bog because it has more nutrients coming into it. And uh, louder? OK. Um, you can think of it as a bog, but it actually is uh, called a fin, uh, F-E-N. And that's a, a term for a bog that has more nutrients in it. Uh, bogs are typically very acidic environments. Um, and this is quite acidic, but it's not totally acidic. So it's called a, a poor fin or an intermediate fin. And it's a very shrubby area. But this is huge. This is like, uh, it's one of the largest peatlands in the area, being 34 acres or more. And a couple of the uh, common species here. On the left, you have the, the large cranberries. And um, I don't know if anybody here has been out to partake in those, uh, the harvest, but uh, there's a lot of cranberries out there. And on the right is the sundew, which is an insectivorous or carnivorous plant, if you want to call it that. Uh, eats tiny insects that crawl onto the sticky little hairs. Um, uh, uh, two common uh, uh, plants associated with the, with the fin. And then one of the rare species uh, plants that I found is, uh, it doesn't look like much, but it's very cottony, and that's, it's called a cotton grass. And this is one of the uh, rare rough cotton grasses, and it's a sedge, technically. Um, but it's a, when you see a whole field of it, or a whole uh, 
uh, bog of it, it's a very impressive thing, especially in late summer and in the fall. We're going to switch away from the lake shore and we're going to go up into some of those uh, flat lands north of the lake. And there is a natural community called a red, maple, or red spruce uh, cinnamon fern swamp. You see the picture here with the spruce in the foreground and then the big tall ferns there are cinnamon fern. But notice the ground cover. Um, in the foreground, you have a lot of the bog moss. And this is very typical of acidic basin swamps. And when I say a basin swamp, it's a perched uh, on a flat area, and it really does not have any water coming, any surface water coming in or leaving. So it's an it's a isolated basin. And there were several very good examples of this natural community. And it's a... Um, this particular uh, example of the swamp had this open area on one end of it that was um, looked like it had been trampled a lot. And I was trying to scratch my head and saying, what, what's been in here? You know, it, it didn't look like moose. It, uh, I didn't see moose tracks or anything. And then I, um, it's a little hard to see here, but the, on the bottom, uh, the left there um, is a coyote scat, and I found several of the droppings of coyote th scattered throughout this area. It was just heavily trampled, and it, who would have thunk it? But some night, uh, they were out there just having a hoot, and uh, they left their evidence. Uh, this is another example of the same community type, but was perched up on top of Bear Mountain in a saddle. Uh, next to the summit of Bur uh, Bear Mountain. And notice there's, again, that nice uh, bog moss that covers the, the bottom there. And um, that's my walking stick there. And um, look what happens to it. That's how deep the, the peat soil is there. And this is up, perched on top of the mountain, essentially. Um, so it has at least three feet of, of muck soil or a peat soil, totally organic material, all decayed uh, moss, uh, sedges, and um, woody stuff. Um, and another type of basin swamp, these again are the ones that don't have many much coming in or going out because they are isolated basins is um, I call the basin shrub swamp. And here it's uh, dominated by the, the shrub winterberry. And it uh, doesn't look like much here, but it is, um, can be a very interesting community in that you'll get these hollows that are, get water filled in the spring and they become vernal pools in themselves. Um, and very important for uh, amphibian reproduction. Um, and indeed, this leads right into the discussion of vernal pools. Um, vernal pools are uh, a fascinating natural community, and um, it turns out that the Nineveh Foundation lands has one of the highest density of vernal pools anywhere in the state. I found over 40 vernal pools on the property. And there had been uh, four or five documented beforehand. But on those flat areas, both south of the lake and north of the lake, these little uh, basins, these isolated little basins, again, don't, they don't have water coming in or out. Um, they fill up in the spring, like you see here and they become very important for amphibian rep uh, reproduction. Here are the uh, eggs of the spotted salamander. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the spotted salamander. It's the big salamander that sometimes uh, is crawling around your driveway in the spring and has big yellow spots to it. I mean, it can be several inches long. 
Um, and this is one species of uh, salamander or amphibian that really likes these vernal pools and actually is a vernal pool, what we call obligate. That's the only place they really uh, breed is in these vernal pools. And uh, again, it's very hard to see, but the dark area in here is a whole mass of wood frog eggs. And uh, the wood frogs also use vernal pools for their reproduction. And if, if, I can't tell you how important these little vernal pools are, but they are sometimes, in many places, they're spaced wide apart. But these, these species, these two species, the wood frog and the spotted salamander, and their other amphibians, only breed in these areas because there's no fish in them. If you think about that, if you, if you breed in a, a pond or a lake or a stream, you always have fish that are gonna eat the eggs of your young. These amphibians are adapted to seek out these vernal pools and that's where they reproduce. And that's the start of the food chain, or, or well into the food chain, is producing these frogs and salamanders, which in turn are eaten by others. Of course, they dry out uh, later in the year, and here you have the bottom uh, exposed uh, mud on the, uh, of a vernal pool, and the tiny little white objects, those are fingernail clams, and that's another good indication of vernal pools. Even when you don't have water and you don't have uh, egg masses showing, you can look for these little tiny fingernail clams. And I'm saying quarter inch or less. They're really small and they'll be on the surface or sometimes actually in the leaves um, on the bottom of these vernal pools. Okay, we're gonna uh, go away from the basin swamps and into a different type of uh, wetland system. And these are called seepage wetlands. Now seepage is, uh, is much different than a basin uh, swamp or a basin uh, wetland system in that you don't have, um, they're A, usually sloping. So it's a wetland that's on a very, usually very gentle slope. And the source of the water for these uh, wetlands is, is the ground. So it's groundwater that's moving, surfacing, and moving through an area on a slope, and it produces uh, another wetland soil, organic soil, called a muck, um, and it varies. Sometimes it's a very shallow muck, which is, uh, we call a seepage forest, and sometimes it's deeper, um, and we call it a seepage swamp. And here you'll notice that there's, um, most of the ones we have in, at Nineveh are mixed of uh, the swamp types or the forested wetlands are a mix of both black and white ash, um, red spruce, balsam fir, hemlock, uh, yellow birch, red maple, and stuff like that. So it's a real mixed forest type, um, but it's a wetland. And there were a lot of these seepage wetlands um, and this is a seepage forest, um, or a seepage swamp here with the deeper uh, mucks. You can see uh, there's my, I, I, I don't even try to keep dry when I do the wetland inventory. <laughs> you know, you just face it, you're gonna get wet. So I just put on my socks and sandals and go, go to it. Um, and that's what it looks like mucking about. Um, here's another example uh, of a, a seepage forest. Uh, to the upper left is the upland, and you, the slope is coming down a pretty good clip in the upland, and then it, it, um, it hits a slope break and it becomes flatter, but it's still sloping, and you get this seepage forest. Same type of seepage forest, but um, with a whole uh, diversity of 
uh, a great diversity of plants and animals. And I talk a lot about plants, but these wetlands are equally, if not more important for most animals. And when I say most animals, I mean the invertebrates, all the bugs that depend on wetlands uh, places and the, the plants, they depend on the plants that occur in these wetlands. And in turn, all the animals usually utilize uh, wetlands at some point in their life, lives. Uh, bears even uh, really appreciate wetlands early in the spring when they come, uh, come out of uh, hibernation and they're really hungry. And one of the first things they do is go to wetlands and eat some of the sedges that are just uh, coming out. So I, 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 you, again, it's very hard to see, but these little forget-me-not flowers here, well, that's a, a very rare uh, uh, plant in, in um, this area. It's called the uh, lesser forget-me-not, and it uh, um, was found, we found it one, uh, found it at one of uh, these seepage forest areas and it loves these uh, muck soils. And if you've ever been into any of these wetlands, you might see this plant is very common and it's really an indicator of seepage systems. And uh, this is swamp saxifrage, it has a tall, um, a very tall flowering uh, stalk that flowers tiny saxifrage flowers early in the year. But this is almost every seepage wetland you'll see this particular plant and the leaves can be up to six inches long. And if you're lucky, you might see moss doing this funny thing around the base of a tree. This happens to be a black ash. Are people familiar with black or brown ash? Does that ring a bell thing? Okay, these are the wetland relatives of our familiar white ash. White ash typically grows in upland situations, whereas the black ash or brown ash or basket ash, depending on who you talk to, um, grows in wetlands. And this is a black ash, and it has this nice little sock of, of, of moss around it. And that's very typical of wetland, of these seepage wetlands, is to have that nice sock around the base of, especially the ash trees. And I, just lucky, you might come across a nest of a, of a thrush. This, I flushed a veery off its nest here. You see the blue eggs in the nest. This is a ground nest. And this was in one of the sweet, uh, seepage wetlands. Sometimes you get an, a very discreet small area where there's no trees growing in it, no shrubs, and you get this lush growth of, uh, of wetland grasses and sedges and other species. We call those areas seeps, S-E-E-P, seep. And seep is a seepage wetland, but just confined to a very small area, and it typically does not have any trees in it. There were many, many seeps throughout the property, even going up to elevation where you get, uh, maybe you get the bog orchids growing in it, the white candles here. Those are called bog candles or bog orchids. Um, and this is up near the top of uh, Saltash Mountain, this little seep area. And again, we're talking, uh, oh, maybe 30 yards by 10 yards, something like that, a very small restricted area. But there are a lot of these scattered around the property, especially up in the, in the mountains. And again, they're small wetlands, but they're very important for a lot of plants and animals. And moose love seeps. <laughs> you all, almost always see with the moose traveling right from seep to seep in the landscape. One of the rare species, or rarer species, is um, northern wild licorice. 
Uh, it's actually a bed straw uh, in the bed straw family. And its Latin name is Gallium Camchaticum, or Camchatkin bed straw. And this, like many of our northern species, have close relatives, if not the same species, as in Northeast Asia, where Kamchatka is. <laughs> and this species, if you were to travel into, you know, Korea or Northeast China, um, into Russia, and uh, you might see this species. And it'd be in a similar habitat. Actually, it would be in hardwood forest that you would recognize most of this, uh, the, you might not know the species, but it would be the ash, maple, basswood. It's remarkable, but that's a, a much older story. I won't talk about that. <laughs> um, and sometimes the seepage uh, areas are formed in these openings. It's just sort of odd, but uh, we call them a seepage meadow. And here we have uh, the great Angelica, um, the big, tall flower, the, the flower head that's like, shaped like a sphere. Um, and that was one of the more interesting things, is finding these seepage meadows uh, uh, scattered around. This is not something you see typically um, in landscapes, but on the Nino Foundation property, I found several of them, which is very intriguing. I'm not sure why they, they are open like that. Um, going to a different type of wetland system uh, associated with streams, we have the beaver meadows and beaver ponds. Um, there are uh, very uh, whole systems of beaver meadows and ponds scattered throughout the property, um, but especially getting down closer to the lake. And um, when, the, when it's active, you get the nice beaver ponds, but then if the dam blows out or the uh, beavers have eaten their, themselves out of the area, um, they'll abandon the dams and the dams will eventually let loose. And you get these beautiful meadows like this. And this is just covered with grasses and sedges and um, in this case, goldenrod. And it's a, it's a wetland community, but it's a little bit different because it can be qu really quite dry to walk through it. Um, it's considered a, a marsh community, but beaver meadows are actually sort of in between. They're, they're, actually, they're totally flooded for a period of time and they become wetlands at that point, but when the dam blows out, they're drained and it can be quite dry, so they're, and they get this nice meadow um, uh, vegetation. And this, uh, in terms of wildlife, the beaver meadows are extremely valuable for wildlife. Um, in the, the snags you get, you develop um, from the trees dying uh, due to inundation. Um, there are numerous birds that use those uh, woodpeckers and then bluebirds and even uh, the great crested flycatcher will uh, nest in these cavities um, after a woodpeckers uh, created the cavity. Uh, and then, of course, for uh, many frog species, it's an uh, important place, and then the birds just come to it, flock to it. So, very important for wildlife. Here's another example in the fall. Um, not much to say other than this had, has a very small beaver pond, and then work, as you work, walk up the drainage, it becomes a seepage forest. And in rare uh, circumstances, you get a, um, a sedge meadow develops. And, and I can't tell you why they sometimes become dominated by one or two sedge species like this. Um, and this meadow and the one, this is close, um, this is on the east side of the property. Um, and these sedge meadows were loaded with uh, cranberries. Uh, the lower, the upper one is, excuse me, no, the, the north one 
was just, uh, it was uh, just incredible how many cranberries I saw in the, uh, in the fall at one of these meadows. But again, this is created by the beavers inundating a shallow basin. And of course, it has to have water flowing in, uh, you know, stream water flowing into it, and then they dam it up. Okay, I'm going to move up uh, into the mountains a little more. Um, one of the remarkable things about the, the property is the streams and, and the water. And um, this, I don't think I've ever seen water so so clear and pure. This is what's called Money Brook. Now, how many people, I want a show of hands, how many people know where Money Brook is? A few, okay? It's not on the maps, <laughs> not on the current maps. The old maps have Money Brook. Um, but this is just, it drains um, uh, part of Bear Mountain and it, uh, it's uh, the north, the far north end of the property. And this is Money Brook, and it has a beautiful, just crystal clear water. And it goes through um, a series of, of little cascades and little ravines. But as you go further down, it develops into another type of ravine. This is a, a, a eroded ravine. So it's deep, deep soils here that have been washed out. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, during Irene, this place was really reamed out. And I have a geologist friend that told me he, they came up and studied this ravine afterwards. And, to, and they tried to figure out how much dirt had flown downstream <laughs> into the um, into the Black River Valley down below. Now, Can you show us on one of your maps there where that is? Yeah, that's up here, far north. Mm -hmm. And where's Bear Mountain? What's that? Bear Mountain, where is that on the map? It's right up in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, the north end of the property. Even the lesser streams uh, might look sort of nondescript and here you see some nice uh, flat stones along the, the bottom of a, a small stream. But you can get three of our native salamander species, which I'd take a special delight in. In the upper left is the northern two-line salamander. The bottom left is the dusky salamander. And then, if you're lucky, way up in the mountains, you'll see this one up here, which is actually sort of orangish colored. And that's the spring salamander. And the spring salamanders can get to be, oh, close to eight inches long. They can get really big. This one's not that big. This is probably four inches. But they can, uh, some people find them in their springs, the spring houses. Um, one reason that they're named that, but they love the mountain spring, uh, the mountain streams. And I found all of these by turning over rocks in the streams. They, they don't like streams that have sandy bottom and, and gravel. They need to have streams that have some flat rocks. Uh, and that's and fairly high gradient. Not, not boulders, but, you know, cobbles and, and uh, uh, flagstones and things like that. So I found all three of our native uh, salamanders, uh, stream salamanders in the streams. And here's another example of a, a salamander habitat. Okay, we move up the mountains and into the forest that dominates the property is northern hardwood forest. That's the sugar maple, white ash, yellow birch. Um, you know, these are the paper birch in, in some instances. Um, these are the species that dominate the landscape. And except when you get to the very tops of the mountains or you get to the very flat areas, it's really the, the hardwood species that dominate the landscape. And um, 
Here you see some nice uh, big trees, uh, fairly big. Here's one, it was about three foot diameter sugar maple. Um, and forests, uh, these big trees um, were scattered around the property, but up in the mountains came across quite a few of them. And um, people have, the foresters have started to call these legacy trees, which I think is a wonderful term. A legacy in that it's a legacy of, a, of another genera I mean, of a generation. And in this case, maybe 150, 200 years old. Um, I don't know that tree particularly, but mature maples of that size typically are well over 100 years and even up to 200, 250 years. Um, so legacy trees, sometimes they don't, uh, they're sort of funny up top. Uh, this one has this big limb that comes out like that on the left-hand side there, way up high. Um, and oftentimes they have a lot of rot in them and the mushrooms uh, will be growing in them. And then of course they die and produce big logs. Now that's another thing about older forests is that when you get big, log, big trees that die, that produces a very unique habitat type. And you saw the, the egg masses of the spotted salamander early, earlier. Well, the adult spotted salamanders in the summer will live under these logs uh, for the summer, and then they'll actually go down in the root, decayed root systems and spend the winter. But dead wood is one of the characterist characteristics of old growth forests. And I, I don't want to dwell too much on old growth, but there were forests that had old growth characteristics and they were never uh, farmed and they were uh, or cleared for agriculture or possibly if they were logged, they were logged early on and they haven't seen any logging for at least 100 years. Um, so the Nineveh uh, Foundation properties, especially on Saltash Mountain, um, up at the higher elevations, they had some of these older forests. And I just wanted to point out another thing about big trees. This is a yellow birch um, that has some lichen that's very leafy lichen. It's called lung lichen, as in your lungs. Um, and older trees uh, tend to get these lichens on them. So that's another thing we don't sometimes think about it too much, but when you get big old trees, that's a, that, that's a habitat type that's available for a long, to colonize by mosses, lichens, you know, and um, other things that can live on these trees. That's, if it's, you're around for 150, 200 years, that's a long, that's a, a habitat where you can count on being stable for a long time. And so this is one species that uh, tends to grow on old trees. It's up top, especially the, the big ones. Here's my brother Todd, and this is an ash tree, a white ash tree. <clears throat> and uh, it's starting to get character. The, another thing about big trees is they start to get character. They, get rot here, they'll lose branches there, get hollow in the center. It all becomes more interesting for wildlife and for other uh, critters. Um, the more mangled and uh, <laughs> they get, they, they become better wildlife habitat. Flying squirrels, woodpeckers, uh, even bears will actually den in uh, big hollow trees. Um, one, yes, um, I was going to say, uh, one really uh, spectacular um, forest occurs up on Saltash Mountain at high elevation, very close to the top, above 2,800 feet and up to even above 3,000 feet. And this is a total surprise to me. And this is a rich northern hardwood forest. 
and it's a, a type of northern hardwood forest. Same canopy, sugar maple dom dominated with some yellow birch, ash, tip, tip, typically more basswood, but not in this particular example uh, because it's too high elevation. But rich northern hardwood forest on Saltash Mountain came out to about 60 acres. It was, and it, I looked at the geologic map before I, I uh, started the inventory and thought, well, uh, this, th we're not going to get rich northern hardwood forest because usually you need some line in the bedrock to, uh, for this type of forest to express itself because it's rich because that means it has high, uh, more fertile soils and the soils are indirectly related to the bedrock that's under it. Um, so uh, I wasn't expecting rich northern hardwood forest, but indeed it is there. And this is one of the uh, indicator species, um, which is flowering now in this, or about to flower in this picture. And this is wild leeks. Now in the spring, it has the big flowers, right? Uh, or the big leaves, the big green leaves that some people use as uh, onions. And, <clears throat> and it, it's delicious to use as an as a, uh, onion green. Um, that's in the spring. Those leaves totally disappear. They're a spring ephemeral. And then it flowers later. And, it, and usually in late June, it's flowering. You'll notice that there are no big wide leaves under it. That's because those spring ephemeral leaves have already decomposed and are part of the leaf litter. Other, th other spring wildflowers you're probably familiar with, Dutchman's brick bridges, um, uh, uh, trout lily, things like that. Those are all a component of these uh, rich northern hardwood forests, uh, as well as a real wealth of other species, including uh, this grass. Believe it or not, there's a species that really likes these fertile northern hardwood forests at elevation, and this is called wild millet. Um, and it, for anybody that has spent time with me outside, uh, you know that I'm wild about grasses and sedges. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time, it's taken me 30 years to learn them, but I know them now. And these uh, native woodland grasses are one of my favorite groups. Um, that's wild millet, typical of the high elevation, rich northern hardwood forest. And another indicator species is this uh, bronze holly fern. Um, and it's really a gorgeous fern. That's the typical growth habit right there, just from this perfect circle of fronds. And um, I've, I've rarely observed it um, eaten, except I have uh, seen um, a little browse early in the year because it overwinters some of its leaves um, that are green. And turkeys, I think, will nibble on it, and deer will nibble on it, but it doesn't seem to be especially uh, sought after. It's not real common, which is another reason you probably, I wouldn't see it so much uh, browsed on or grazed on. And if you're real lucky, you might see round-leaved orchid, uh, which is Platanthera macrophylla. And those leaves are yay big. I mean, they're six or seven inches long and not quite as wide, four or five inches wide. And you see there are two leaves, always either one or two leaves, and they're flat on the ground. And they're very succulent. I mean, they're, they're like a, they're thick and just very smooth and, and sort of mushy almost. And um, I, this is a very rare orchid in, in Vermont. And it likes these more fertile uh, northern hardwood forests. And we found a couple populations uh, in these woods. And I think one of the reasons we don't see more of them is because of uh, deer grazing pressure. Because I, I just, they got to be just really 
delicious to eat. I mean, they're just so moist and I, I don't think they have any poisonous aspect to them. It's, this is just about the bloom, it's not quite open. Okay, going up higher in the mountains, um, there's some unusual uh, uh, habitat types, which I called, this is all my invention, I called them montane tall herb glades. Hmm, where did you get that name? <laughs> Me, up in the mountains, sometimes, especially in the Coolidge Range, uh, so over onto Killington and Pico and stuff, up high elevations, above 3,000 feet mostly, you'll come across these little meadows. They're openings in the woods. And they're very, you'll see a lot of real tall herbs and uh, not so much grasses and sedges, but uh, tall herbs, including golden rods, but also uh, white snake root, and uh, just a great diversity of plants. And it's usually related to a seep, but it's not a real seep system. And this is a very mysterious thing. You can get great angelica uh, growing in places like this. Um, you can get our native uh, uh, wetland um, uh, thistle, the tall thistle, will sometimes grow in these places, as well as cow parsnip. <clears throat> and here's a, one with cow parsnip in it. And these are tiny places. They might only be, oh, uh, 100 feet by 50 feet or something like that. They're really small uh, places. Um, they're very diverse. And here's a, another opening, uh, one of these glades. And what's really remarkable is right there, the soil. That is black, uh, organic rich soil that a gardener would kill for. I mean, it is some of the most rich soil. It's not a wetland soil. At least most of the area is not wetland. It's not saturated but it's just black and rich, and it can be up to a foot deep of that stuff. And that's why you have those tall herbs, you know? It's because it's growing in that beautiful, uh, rich soil. And so this is a little uh, unusual thing that occurred up on Saltash Mountain uh, to a lesser degree on uh, Bear Mountain. But at high, again, high elevations, um, I found these. What would, what would cause the opening? Why, why aren't there not trees there? Uh, I'm going to hazard. I do not know the answer, but it's outcompeted by the uh, by the herbaceous vegetation. Mm -hmm. And I, a tree uh, seedling, I think would have a hard time living with that type of veg vegetation. If, you know, in the uh, winter it all flops over and produces a nice thatch. That's why some meadows, you know, grassy meadows that are really uh, fertile soil and moist and they produce a nice thatch in the winter. Spring, the trees just don't have a chance to germinate in that thing. That's a wild guess. I don't know, but uh, interesting thought. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see these things. But this is, these are beech trees, and I wanted to talk a little bit about bears. Um, these are beech, there's a uh, grove of beech trees on uh, at higher elevation, not near the top, but uh, higher elevation on, <clears throat> on Saltash Mountain that it was just remarkably scarred up by bears climbing to get the beech nuts in the fall. And Silos and uh, Andy Topher and I were out uh, a couple falls ago when we were doing inventory work. And we went, walked through this grove and, um, and there was fr uh, fresh bear droppings right there on the ground. And uh, you could see where the, the, the bears had climbed the trees. You could see the fresh claw marks, not the old scar mark, but the fresh claw marks. 
and you just, it, it, you know, the droppings weren't steaming, but it was almost that fresh. Um, anyway, there were over 20 trees that were well scarred up by bear in this single grove, and it goes on to, uh, to the state property, to Coolidge State Forest. Um, so bears were not only really present there, but surprise, surprise, you see that scar on the upper part of the trunk there? That's a big scar, it's an old scar. And there's some uh, claw marks that are lower down on the trunk. This is a red pine, okay? I saw how many, maybe six red pines on the whole property. I mean, these are native red pines, these weren't planted. And this was south of the lake on just one little, uh, looked like a sandy ridge, uh, very unusual. I, I was totally surprised to see them, but they're red done, and most of these were scarred by bears. And they're not just scarred, they're bitten by the bears. And the bears are really widely known to do this to red, preferentially to red pine, because red pine, Pinus resinosa, has very, is very pitchy and for some reason the bears are attracted to creating that pitchy environment and i don't they bite it they literally bite it <laughs> the trees and so this is a, a bear bitten red pine and there were like i said i only had a few a uh, handful of, of trees and they most of them were bitten yeah. are the red pines a weak species by comparison to others it, to what are, are, they, are the red pines a weaker species of conifer than some of the others? Weaker in which way are you talking about? They don't survive extremities and so forth. I, I remember from Connecticut seeing a lot of attrition with red pine. Uh -huh. um, well, Connecticut, um, that's not their native range. That's too far south. They're a northern species. They are most abundant out in the Great Lakes states, around the Great Lakes themselves. Um, in the proper habitat, they're not a weak species at all. But most, they're, they're, it's uncommon in Vermont, and it's really in some of the driest habitat that they, um, they you see little colonies on top of cliffs, um, in real sandy soil, and things like that. So, bear bitten red pine. And I can't, I have to throw in one beautiful red eft. Everybody knows the little orange salamanders. Those are actually, this is the terrestrial stage of a newt. It's called the red spotted newt, but they're called red efts at this stage. Um, very common. And they don't need the vernal pools to, uh, to breed. They breed in the water, um, in beaver ponds and things like that. Um, but during this, st the immature stage, they're orange and they're totally terrestrial. They're not in the water at all. And then as they uh, become adults, they turn green and they get these tiny red spots on them and they're totally aquatic. They live their lives in the water when they're adults. Interesting little history, uh, natural history. Tops of the mountains, uh, in addition to the spruce fir forest, you have an interesting, very open forest uh, called a red spruce, yellow birch, or uh, excuse me, montane red spruce, yellow birch forest. And montane meaning of the mountains. And this is always at higher elevation. And it gets uh, very open canopies, um, or very, uh, yeah, very open canopy, where you get these yellow birch with very bushy tops to them. Usually the birch are only, oh, 40 feet or 45 feet or less in height. Uh, they get very small, they get uh, hit by ice storms and things like that, a lot of broken branches. And here's one of the yellow survivor yellow birches, and it's hard to see, but half the tree is dead, 
and you, the orange half there is all dead wood. And then on the right-hand side, that's all live tree. And it, who knows how old, it's a very a huge uh, tree, either, even uh, three feet in diameter or more. And um, if you really want to know where the place to get a view is, you have to got to really scrounge around because there's not many views on tops of the mountains here. And this, if you go to this ledge and then you crawl up on top the ledge, you get a nice view. And what is that to the east is a Scutney. That's a beautiful view of a Scutney. This is on Bear Mountain. I'm not going to tell you where, but this is on Bear Mountain. And then if you look to the uh, southeast, you look out over New Hampshire and into Massachusetts. And you can't see it in this photo right here, but actually I, with binoculars, I could see all the way to Monadnock Mountain in New Hampshire, southern on the uh, Massachusetts border in New Hampshire. So that's just an overview of the property. And I've talked a lot about natural communities and some rare species. And this was all part of uh, a two-year ecological in inventory um, that I did with Andy Topher, who's unfortunately not here today. Uh, Andy did a lot of the analysis, the GIS uh, mapping uh, work, and created these beautiful maps here, which I hope you'll all get a chance to look at. Um, and the Nineveh Foundation was, the, none of this would have happened without the Nineveh Foundation. And I, for one, say thank you to all the uh, members of the Nineveh Foundation, the, the board, and the organization for supporting this effort, this inventory. <clears throat> and uh, they were uh, very accommodating. Uh, Mari, where, where are you, Mari? It's right there. She was on top of everything. And I thank you personally for all the work you put in and the correspondence. She was on top of it all the whole way. Um, <laughs> Uh, and um, let's see, who else am I forgetting? Oh, Silos is back there, uh, the forester, lands manager with the Farm and Wilderness and the Nineveh Foundation. And uh, Silas and Andy Topher and I had a, a, a memorable fall day out on the property, and he helped with uh, uh, supplying background information. And I want to take this time. Um, Oh, first to say that these maps and um, the report that I, I wrote on this inventory are going to be posted soon they're on the web. Right now on the Nineveh Foundation website, and there are going to be printouts over here on the table of a summary of Brett's report, a three-page summary, and in that in that printout is a link to where you can find these, the maps, the report, wow. the full report, and the maps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there, it is going to be posted online, and the summary, which is over there on the table, um, of the the report, uh, will have that information on it. Um, so definitely want to check that out. Yes. In your travels around the property, have you noticed any species or areas that have been impacted by disease or insects? Um, there's always disease in insects, but nothing of nothing out of the ordinary. The beech trees throughout the state are impacted by beech bark disease, and they certainly were impacted on the property. Um, but other than that, not like the emerald ash borer. I saw no damage uh, of that, um, and. I don't know, Silos would be a better person to ask. I, didn't look, I wasn't looking particularly for that, but I didn't notice anything. Um, I want to say one other thing um, before I leave, and I want to acknowledge one dear friend who is with us today, um, Nancy Bell, 
Uh, she is a, a dear friend of mine. She is a mentor. Uh, she's a colleague. I work with her with, uh, through the Conservation Fund. Um, and she is a ardent conservationist uh, that has done amazing work throughout northern New England, but particularly in this area, with both the Farm and Wilderness Lands and the Nineveh Foundation Lands. Um, her work is felt widely, and she is good friends with bears, so watch <laughs> out. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Okay, um, that's all I have to, for this uh, little presentation, and uh, we wanted to do questions, is that right? Sure. Yeah. Did you make any particular observations of the high elevation mountain ash? Um, of mountain ash. ash. Um, that is a good question. Could you repeat the question? It, oh, the, the question was, did I make any observations about the high elevation mountain ash? Uh, mountain ash is not a true ash, by the way. That's a, uh, it's in the rose family, of all things. Um, I did not notice mountain ash particularly at, at elevation. Um, I know it from northern Vermont. It's very common in the mountains, up in the mountains. It's in the spruces all over the top. What's that? Those ash trees are in the spruces on the top of the mountain all over the place. Yeah. Well, they, you know, I'm, I'm sure I have it in my notes, but I didn't notice it as being unusual. It's there, that's where you find those, the mountain ash is in the tops of the mountains at higher elevations. Usually, uh, well, it's certainly above 2,500 feet. Um, but uh, yeah, it was there, but I didn't note anything unusual. It, as you go up in the northern Green Mountains, where I do a lot of work. It, it's uh, very common there, and in the White Mountains as well. Other questions? Yeah. Is there a marked trail of salt ash? <laughs> um, no. The, the, uh, the question was, is there a marked trail up Salt Ash Mountain? And um, as far as I know, there is not. Um, nor is there a trail up um, uh, Bear Mountain that I know of. Uh, there might be a trail from the other side. Nancy, do you know uh, if there's a trail up Salt Edge from the Shrewsbury side? I mean, there's Wood Road. Wood oh, Woods Road. Road. So okay. Your way up. But I'm glad I you asked that. I didn't hear it. Woods, Woods Road, did you oh, Woods Road, an old logging road uh, from the Shrewsbury side. From the, so that would be in Coolidge State Forest not on the Nineveh Foundation lands. Um, which brings up a, a thing I, I wanted to talk about a little bit. And one thing, I felt this was truly a privilege to be able to work on these lands. Um, I'm a naturalist. I love being out in, in uh, wild places. But I was really impressed with the, the maturity, the, the beauty, of the forests on the property, uh, the abundance of wetlands, which you will see on the maps if you have a chance to look at. These are all wetlands that we mapped. Oh, they're, they're wetlands scattered throughout, mostly small, but they're scattered throughout. And just the, um, the quietness and the wildness of the, uh, the forest. It's not to say that it wasn't uh, some of the property, especially around the lake, was farmed. We know that there are numer uh, or a few foundations on the property, not at elevation, but, um, but it's a wild place. And I, I hope that the Nineveh Foundation and Farm and Wilderness, as they move forward with uh, managing these properties, will. Well, remember the wilderness part of farm and wilderness, and that this is really a, a rare, a rare place. And more and more to have wild areas, and these, uh, this property is is just beautifully wild. And I, for one, love it that there are no. I didn't see trails. It's just uh, it's great for the critters. Yeah. Excuse me. It might be in your report, but do you have a. a a, like a checklist of breeding bird or nesting birds uh, of the area? 
Um, it's not in the report, um, and I, I did not make a checklist. I did note birds as I went throughout, and I do have a list of birds that I saw, but I, have, I did not specifically do an inventory of birds. But um, I'll make that available to uh, Farm and Wilderness. And, and the, the list is not in the report? It's not in the report. Yeah, it, this is a list of birds for the property, and I did not make a specific list. I did not do a specific inventory of birds, but I did make a short list of birds that I served on the property. Other questions? And it's the... Uh, uh, are white ash, brown ash, black ash all equally susceptible to the emerald ash borer? Um, the question is, are the different ash species equally susceptible to emerald ash borer? Um, I have been told by one of the state experts um, that the black ash, or the one that lives in swamps, is the most susceptible. And the, one, the, the ash that I saw that had been um, affected by emerald ash borer up near Montpelier were on black ash. Um, and apparently, white ash, of course, is, is very susceptible. And the predictions are very dire. They, uh, the state people are saying that once it starts, it, it will, they do great damage. And that's the, the what they've learned out in the Midwest is that um, this is a serious, will have very serious implications for all the ash species. Yeah. They Sorry. are finding that the maybe up to 10% are resistant in some manner. What's that? They are finding that up to 10% of the trees are resistant. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it may not wipe them out totally. Well, yeah, that's that's good and. One thing that is hard about the um, emerald ash borer is that I've been told that they affect the young trees before they mature. And so if, you, if the, um, the emerald ash borer affects the young trees, then they won't get to reproduce. And so that's a really bad situation. You can think of beech and uh, Dutch, uh, or the elms also are affected by diseases. But unlike the ash uh, and the emerald ash borer, those diseases take years to develop and usually the trees will mature and produce uh, fruit uh, or seed before they die. And um, so anyway, that's something, another thing to consider. Uh, yeah. I don't know if this is a question for you or for the foundation, but I was just curious now that you have this wonderful data and these beautiful maps, if you have plans on how you would use the information? I'm going to turn that over to Rebecca, <laughs> unless you want me to. <laughs> Before I answer that, I just want to appreciate not only the work that Brett's done, but his coming here and taking the time to really educate us about the amazing findings that he did. So. And now that we know where you are, <laughs> um, I'm going to defer that answer for a moment because I did want to respond to something that Brett mentioned about the wilderness, the farm wilderness, and the wild spaces. Um, it's really important that we preserve the, um, the natural habitats for people that only are hiking through the wilderness. And at the same time, there are a number of trails and systems that are important for us to maintain so that people can get closer to the wilderness. Um, accessibility and also appreciation. So that's one thing that we've already started to do as an organization, and I appreciate the, the enthusiasm and support of the Nineveh community members who step in and are willing to really help that work. Because if we don't, not only for community members here, but also our next generation, to get them out there, whether they're connected with farm wilderness or residents of Nineveh and, and visitors, we need them to be able to see the appreciation and also have educational moments like this for that next generation. So that is one of the goals that we as an organization combined with Nineveh are planning to do. And any ideas that you have as community members, residents, 
around trails or, or things that we can do to enhance what already exists and provide greater access, let us know. Because it's really, this is for, for, for you, it's for us, and it's for the next generation. So that's one thing we definitely plan on, on keeping that wilderness aspect and there are other opportunities um, that we need to hear from you. So thank you, I hope you'll spend some time mingling after. I appreciate you wearing the name tags because I might have met you three years ago and remembering names is always challenging for some of us. So thanks for coming, please stick around, have some refreshments and let's get to know each other.